Good evening. How are you guys? My name is Andrew Gabbert, and that means I will live up here tonight. Uh, I, I might look down more than Michael does. I'm not quite as practiced as he is at hanging my toes over the edge. Um, I am the director of media here, so normally I'm back there somewhere. I'm not used to being up here, so forgive me if I'm a little nervous tonight. Um, we are going to look at Joshua 1 tonight. I, one of the things that I'm still learning how to do in preparing for a lesson is listening for the voice of the Lord. And so that's going to come up in our study tonight. Um, how, do you, how do you know what God is leading you to do? So if you want to, you can open up to Joshua 1. We're going to look at the first nine verses. I believe there are, are outlines in the back, hopefully, if you, uh, if you need one. This is, um, the, the, my goal for this evening is for you to examine your life and try to answer the question, where is the enemy attacking me? One thing that I've learned uh, as I have been engaging in his discipleship more and more is it's one thing to know how to fight the enemy in spiritual warfare. That's an important, a critical part of, of the, our spiritual walk, right? Our relationship with the Lord is knowing how to fight the enemy. Because as we know, our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is spiritual in nature, right? We fight against the forces of evil. And so it's a different kind of battle. While we can know how to fight the enemy, it's a whole nother thing to become aware of the spiritual warfare. That's a separate issue. And I've, I've learned that sometimes it's really hard to, re to recognize this is spiritual warfare. What I'm experiencing right now is not normal. This isn't just life. This is the enemy attacking me and trying to hinder my walk with the Lord, trying to obstruct my progress. So as we go through this passage, we're going to look at how Joshua, how God is preparing Joshua for battle. And we're going to talk about how that relates to our spiritual warfare that we engage in every single day. So think about that as we go through the text. Try to... Um, Try to increase your self-awareness where the enemy is attacking you because if you can understand your circumstances from a spiritual perspective, you'll be far more equipped to fight the battle properly and to focus your attention in the right places. So uh, in Joshua chapter 1, this is the, the end of uh, an era for the nation of Israel. The chapter begins, Moses has died. Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses. He commissions Joshua as the next leader of Israel. This is, uh, this is a weighty moment for the people of Israel. Moses is the greatest leader Israel will ever have until Jesus comes. Hands down. The Bible affirms that for us, right? He's, he's a prophet unlike any they had seen or would see after. He is the one through whom God uses to deliver the law, which is the foundation of their entire culture and government and society. Moses is uh, the conduit through which God performs crazy stuff <laughs> against the Egyptians, right? The 10 plagues. It, it's easy, if you grow up in the church like I did, sometimes it's easy to forget that those are real. It's not just a Bible story. Those things actually happened in real life. Wild, wild stuff. I mean, we, we see, um, we sometimes talk about, you know, supernatural healings or whatnot with people getting their, their, you know, maybe their back is hurt and God heals their body. That's awesome. And God does that absolutely. We're talking miracles on a magnitude that we have never seen. Uh, at least I haven't. <laughs> and so it, it, Moses parted the Red Sea, right? They're walking through the Red Sea on dry ground. 
They see the cloud of the Lord leading them by day, the fire, pillar of fire by night. What Moses did with the Israelites, what he lived through, is foundational for the nation's identity. What God did through him shaped who the people of Israel would be. Now, as we may know, hopefully, um, the people of Israel left Egypt, and they, the Lord leads them through the Red Sea into the wilderness, right up to this land that God has promised to give them, right? We call it the promised land. This was a land flowing with milk and honey, right? The resources were abundant. It was, uh, it was gorgeous. It was plentiful. It was ready for them. God said, I'm going to give this to you. And they went right up to it, and they said, well, wait, before we go in, let's send a few people just to make sure that it's going to be okay, All right? So they send out 12 spies. Two of them are Joshua and Caleb. They come back. Only Joshua and Caleb say, we got this. God is with us. Let's go in. The other 10 are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Those, they're, they're pretty big. <laughs> they're giants. So we're like grasshoppers, and I don't really feel like getting squished today. So let's maybe not go in. And the Lord's like, what are you doing? And so they are condemned, they are uh, judged, and they are sentenced to 40 years in the wilderness. Now, if you've seen a map of this, it doesn't take 40 years to go through that wilderness. They're just kind of circling around for 40 years because that, that's what God, that's how he was judging them, right? Every man 20 years old and up will die. They're not allowed to enter the promised land. That was the sentence. And so uh, at that point, Moses and Joshua and Caleb were allowed to go in. Eventually, Moses, he has his own issues, and God says, no more, you can't go in anymore, right? So we've gotten to this point where this leader who has led Israel through the, um, the most formative years of, for this nation, he has now died. And so they enter a period of mourning for uh, 30 days, I believe, and now... Uh, at, right at the end of his life, everyone knew that Joshua was going to be the next leader. He had been with Moses from, from the beginning, and he had, been, he had fought in battles that the Israelites were engaged in during those 40 years. He had seen, he had gone with Moses partway up the mountain when God is delivering the law, and, and the people of Israel were too afraid to even touch the mountain. Joshua was there. Joshua was the right-hand guy. And so the Lord had been preparing Joshua this whole time uh, to take over the nation, uh, to lead the nation when Moses would, would die. And so the Lord took Moses up on the mountain, said, it's time for you to die. I'm going to take you now. Moses uh, lays his hands on Joshua, commissions Joshua as the next leader. Now Moses has died, and, and it's time for Joshua to step up. So the first point that we're going to look at tonight as we think through what Joshua is going through and applying it to spiritual warfare we're going to look at the warrior's commission. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place, from the sole of your, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness... And this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them. The first thing I want to point out, as we look at the plan that God is laying out for the people of Israel and the part that Joshua would play, something I want you to notice is the description of Joshua. So after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Now, you may have different words there, Moses' minister or, or other things. There are other, different translations have different words there. The point is, who was Joshua? Well, as God is appointing Joshua to lead the nation of Israel, his chosen people, Joshua is described as the assistant to the servant of the Lord. 
the leader of God's chosen people, right? It'd be easy to think that Joshua is somebody, right? He's now leading God's people. And yet this describes him as the assistant of the servant of the Lord. That may be small, uh, it's a small point in the text, but I just want, because of how the nature of spiritual warfare, alive the enemy that he may have whispered in your ear before is you're nobody. The good news is you can respond and say, yeah, I know, you're right. Joshua, the leader of Israel, the man to follow Moses, the great prophet, the lawgiver. Joshua is the assistant of the servant. And yet he was the one that God had raised up for that moment. So the question, the first question is, what is the mission? What is God requiring of Joshua? This is a pivotal moment, as I mentioned before, in the life of Israel, because The story, Moses' life is over. That chapter is done. That part of Israel's history is over. But there's still unanswered questions. Israel is not yet in the promised land. And this great leader who was supposed to lead them into the promised land is gone. What now, right? The people of Israel are probably going, okay, we've been hearing about this promised land, right? Because remember, everybody who was going to go in is now dead. So it's all new people. It's new faces. They're like, okay, we've been hearing about these, this big old fruit that you guys brought back from the promised land, those huge grapes and, and all the pomegranates, and, and we're, we're tired of manna. We're tired of walking around in the wilderness. We're ready to go in. And Joshua comes up. The Lord uh, meets with Joshua at this moment to say, my work is not done yet. Moses, my servant, is dead, but I am not done. When God is up to something, It is not dependent on you or me for him to accomplish his purposes. That's really, really important for us to understand. We are not special. We're not somebody. We're not, we weren't chosen by God to be a part of his family because we're strong or smart or cool or attractive, wise, you name it, it doesn't matter. We were chosen by God because of his grace. That's it period, end of story. So as God is working, uh, we've, had, we've had death in our families, our, our, in our extended family, even, even death that we might consider untimely. The comfort is God is still moving. As one leader passes on and the next generation rises up, God is still moving. He's not done. Moses did not see the promises fulfilled. Right? He'd never, he saw the promised land from a distance, but he was never able to go in. But that didn't matter because God's plan was longer than the life of Moses. And so as you guys are uh, walking through the daily life, right? Maybe, maybe you might even call it the daily grind, we can take comfort in the fact that no matter what we accomplish in our own lives, God's plan is bigger than that. And he's doing things that we can't see and that we will never know. And that's okay. In fact, that's a good thing. (laughs) If God was restricted to using me, his plans would have to be pretty small. Um, One of the things, this came out this week in some conversation with some of the other staff guys. We were, um, summertime is a time of trips, vacation, camps, all kinds of stuff. Staff is in and out. They're, They're doing different things. And so one of the guys came back and he said, um, he said, I feel a little out of the loop because I've, I've been away at camp so much. He's, he's just, there's been things going on. And yet his ministry has continued to move. In fact, his, the ministry is as strong as ever. And what he, was, the, what he was pointing out was, he was reminding us that our ministry here at Evergreen is not because the staff is all that. What God is doing at Evergreen is not because Michael is such a great teacher, I think he's a wonderful teacher. He's so good with the Word of God. I think the way he communicates, uh, I wish that I could communicate like that. Um, the, we've got fantastic student leaders. We've got fantastic men and women's ministry leaders. We have a wonderful team that loves each other and is pouring their heart and soul into the church. But that's not why Evergreen 
is growing and, and improving and changing lives, and we're seeing, we're seeing transformation. We're seeing those things because God is up to something. It has nothing to do with us. We are merely the, the assistant to the servant that God has said, this is where I want you for now. That's it. And wherever you are in your life, the enemy may try to say, you're nobody. And you can say, yeah, I know. Yeah. But God has put me here. And so I'm going to continue with the work that he has because he's the one that's up to something. And after I'm gone, he will still be up to something. We'll, we'll continue with those thoughts as we, as we move forward. So the, the charge, what is the mission that, that God gives to Joshua? It's very simple. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all his people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. He has one task, or one task. That's it. Go into the land. That's it. God says, you go, and I will give. It's interesting that he doesn't say, go in and take the land. Now, there are, we can get into some of the other passages because this promise, this um, the, the promise of the, of the land, it comes up several times in uh, the Old Testament. But I do find it really fascinating that God says, you go and then I'll give, right? He doesn't say, um, prepare your men for battle, go and train for war, and um, when you're good enough, then we'll go and you can take it. He says, your job is to go and I will give you the land. In fact, he says, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. Their whole job literally is to walk through the land. Wherever you walk, that's yours. I've given it to you. Now, that doesn't mean that Joshua and the Israelites have no responsibility, right? It doesn't mean they just, you know, kind of leave their stuff and just go, okay, I think we'll go over here today. Right? There's more intentionality than that. We, there, there, Joshua understands that God has, we see in, in Deuteronomy and Numbers where the promises come up previously, that God says, you're going to utterly destroy the land, the, the inhabitants of the land. Don't keep any of it for yourself. It's all devoted to me, devoted uh, to destruction for my sake. Right? So they, he knows that there are tasks that they need to accomplish. But I, I find it so fascinating. The way that this is worded is very intentional. Go into the land that I have given you. Every, everywhere you walk, I have given it to you. Right? What's the point? God is the one who's moving. God is the one who provides. God is the one who says, I will accomplish my purposes. Your job is to obey. Your job is to go. So the mission is to cross the Jordan and go into the land. Now, crossing the Jordan is no small thing. This is a raging river in the time of the year when the banks are overflowing, right? This is, uh, this is not the Arkansas in the dead of August over here at, on North Memorial or South Memorial, right? This is the Arkansas River way upstream where it's full all the time up in Sand Springs, okay? How do you take over a million people across that? When you don't have boats, you don't have rafts, what do you do? Well, right now, God's not worried about that. That will come, and God has his way of doing things. In fact, just a side note, the way that God does that is actually his way of affirming Joshua before the people. The people realize, oh, God really has appointed Joshua, right? There's a purpose behind everything that God does. But he says, cross the Jordan and go into the land, and I will give it to you. Now, he describes the boundaries of, of what he is giving to them. And what you find, if you read on, is that Israel does not actually take that whole property. They, they don't actually conquer all of that portion of the land because of their disobedience. But God has said, this is what I've allotted for you. This is available to you. All you have to do is go. Now, one thing that I want to mention, just a, a bit of a, a rabbit trail here, God was commanding them to take over the land. This was a bloody endeavor, right? He says, wipe them out completely, everybody. Livestock, people, all of it, destroy it. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 4 says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away the, nations, the many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, 
the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. Right? So there's purpose behind the command. You see through the book of Joshua and through the Old Testament as a whole, God is, is chiefly concerned with the purity of their worship. He says, you worship me, nothing else. And he knows that the people of the land will turn their hearts away from the Lord if they don't utterly destroy them. And he, that's exactly what he says. Don't give your daughters to them. Don't give your sons to them because they will turn your hearts away from me and you to serve other gods. So you need to wipe them out. In order to protect who I've created you to be, you have to eliminate all temptation for idolatry. In this case, that means killing everybody and all the animals, everything devoted to destruction. Now, in today's culture, they say, look at that bloodthirsty God. How can you worship him? This is one of the tactics of the enemy, spiritual warfare, right? We're thinking about spiritual warfare. He's going to come and say, how can God be good if he commands the complete destruction of entire nations? How can, God, how can you worship a God who does that? How can he be loving? Okay, well, there's, there, that is a hard question, but we also have some answers for that. Now, I, I want to share some of that with you, not because we just gloss over it, because we're talking about real people who were actually devoted to destruction. Now, Israel did not obey fully, uh, as we find out later in the Old Testament, but the, the command was the same nonetheless. So just, just so that you guys um, maybe can have something to say when you hear somebody say, how, how can a good God order the destruction of entire peoples? There are, there's a verse in, um, earlier in the Pentateuch where, um, or it's in Genesis, uh, where God is talking with Abraham, and he says, the... Uh, the sins of the Amorites, I think it's the Amorites, the sins of the Amorites is not yet completed, right? The idea is that God has, is not ready to judge them yet, but God, of course, knows what's coming in the future. Um, and so what we see here between that verse and, and these verses, we see the patience of God, right? We know from other parts of the Old Testament, uh, for example, um, uh, is it Zechariah, I can't remember which prophet, um, was a prophet to uh, Nineveh. Uh, Jonah was, obviously, but there was, there was um, who am I thinking of? Obadiah? I can't remember. Anyway, um, there's a whole book of prophecy to other nations. There's a few of them. A few of the minor prophets are, are prophesying to Edom and to uh, Assyria and to others. The point is, God is, uh, Amos has a, uh, two chapters on this, the point is that God is concerned for all of the nations. He is not only concerned about Israel. And repeatedly we see the message, if you repent, I will restore you. I will bring you back. I will, I will um, prosper you. Even to the nations outside of Israel, that message is consistent. Now, the, Bible fo the Old Testament focuses primarily on Judah and Israel uh, for obvious reasons. They're God's chosen people. But, but we see this heart for the, the nations all around Israel at the same time. What we see um, following this account just a couple of chapters later is the story of Rahab, who protects the spies as they go into Jericho, as they're scouting out Jericho and getting ready to destroy Jericho. Now, if you know that story, the Israelites don't destroy Jericho. God destroys Jericho. They go in and they kill everybody after God has uh, broken down the wall through his miraculous power. But what we see, this is so fascinating— Rahab is not an Israelite. She had never talked to an Israelite, as far as we know. But when the spies come into the land and they meet her, she says, I have heard about your God. I know the stories. We have heard about what God did to the Egyptians and to the, the nations that you encountered in the wilderness. 
We know how you defeated them. I want to serve your God. Will you, will you protect me? I'll save you from, from our people. I'll help you escape. Will, but when you come in to take over Jericho and destroy the city, please protect my family. Don't destroy our family. It's like, perfect. Yeah, deal. Yes, good. And that's what happens. They, she, the spies get out. She lies to the authorities and says they went this way when really they went this way. They get back to Israel. They say, let's go and take the land. God gives them instructions. They go and they do it. And then they save Rahab and her family. What I love about that story is it addresses a second concern that the enemy loves to cast doubt in our minds as believers. The second concern that's so popular is what about those who have never heard? What happens to the tribes in Africa where there's never been a missionary? How can God send them to hell? If you can only be saved by believing in the gospel, what do you do about them? Well, part of the answer we see in this story of Rahab. She had never talked to an Israelite before, but when they came, she was ready to follow Yahweh because the work of God had spread far and wide. We see uh, in, in other, in, in like Psalm uh, 19, for example, we see how the heavens declare the glory of God. We see this idea that uh, what we call general revelation, we can look around the world and see that there's intelligent design behind everything that is around us. That speaks to the existence of a creator, right? We can know some things about God just by looking around us. We don't need the Bible to know some things about God. Now, we need what we call special revelation, the Word of God, to interpret those things for us so we can properly understand them. And this, the Bible is God's Word. It gives us a fuller revelation so we can know more than the things that we can just observe from nature. But the work of God was enough to stir her heart to say, this is the one true God. I need to follow him. No one had told her who Yahweh was. She probably didn't even, had never even heard the name Yahweh, but she knew this is the God that I need to follow. This is the, this is the one. And so what we can see is that um, God is fully able to reveal himself without the use of a missionary. And so what we, we know from the Bible that God is just. We see that all over the place. He never makes a mistake. So when someone says, what about people who have never heard? God does not need a missionary to tell people, to show people who he is. Now he chooses to use the people of God to spread the gospel. That's his primary method. But it is not required for him to reveal himself to somebody else. Okay, so as we look at this commission, he says, um, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. This is verse five. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. The important thing about that is that Joshua followed Moses so closely that he knew intimately the relationship that Moses had with God. He saw it with his own eyes. Now think of, try to imagine Joshua being put in this position if he had never served under Moses. If he hadn't seen that, if he was new, to, if he was new in his faith. Let's say he, he didn't know God that well. He didn't, he didn't watch all the things that God did before. He didn't watch how Moses interacted with him. Joshua was the one who was standing outside the tent of meeting when God would meet with Moses. Joshua, like I said, went up the mountain uh, and, and saw things and was closer to God physically um, than the Israelites were willing to go. Joshua, uh, God was able to explain the assurance this assurance that he was giving Joshua in a way that he understood, because of Joshua's experience with Moses, God was able to encourage Joshua in a way that um, was meaningful, in a way that meant something real. It wasn't just a promise. This was a promise that had weight. It had purpose. It had meaning behind it because Joshua had experienced these things. He knew what how God was with Moses because he saw it with his own eyes. So when God says, I will be with you just as I was with Moses, Joshua, I'm sure there's a deep sigh of relief there. 
oh, okay, good. Because you're telling me to go over there and there's a bunch of people and I've seen them and I know that you can help us defeat them, but man, I'm really, really glad to hear that. Thank you, God. We have to take other believers by the hand and bring them with us and show them what it means to be with God. We have to for their sake. Not only is it, is it commanded in Scripture, discipleship, it's essential to the survival of the church so that when God comes to somebody and says, I will be with you just as I was with your discipler, and you can say, oh, okay, that helps me to, to, to understand what that means, right? Sometimes we say things and we hear things in church and we don't actually ask, well, what does that really mean, right? God, God is with us. Great. Good. I don't know. What, is that, what does that mean that God is with us? What does it mean that he walks with me every day, that he lives in my heart? What does that even mean? Well, if you've walked with another believer who is further along in their faith, and you can see how intimate their relationship is with the Lord, then now when God says, I will be in you, I will be with you, when, when we read in John 15, Christ says, abide in me and I will abide in you. If we see that in somebody else, all of a sudden we realize, oh, that's what that looks like. It actually affects my life. It actually changes the way that I make decisions, the way that I process ideas, the way that I interact with other people, because I see how this person who's gone before me, how it's changed them. That is essential. If you are not being discipled by somebody, if you don't have somebody who's investing their life in you, there's not one way to do that. There are lots of ways to do that. But if you don't have somebody who's investing into you to say, let me help you walk through this life. I'm going to be there for you. I want to walk with you. I'm here to support you. I'm here to, to help you understand what it means to follow Jesus. Find someone. If you need to, come talk to a pastor. We will, we will help connect you with people. There are people in this church who want to disciple people, and they don't know who, to, who needs it. If you need that, please come talk to us. If you are, um, if you want to, if you're not discipling somebody else, that's a problem. That's not just, um, that's not a small thing. It's not something to just be overlooked. We must be there for each other and take somebody else to say, I don't have it all figured out, but I, I, want, I want to walk with you. I want to be there to support you and help you out. Let's do this together. So Joshua is commissioned. God says, here's the plan. You're going to go in, and I'm going to give you the land. So maybe Joshua might be thinking at this point, well, okay, great. How do I do that? What am I, like, I don't, I know we're supposed to destroy everybody, but they're a lot bigger than us. And even though Joshua has the faith, there are still questions to be answered. This is where we see God answer those questions before Joshua even asks them in uh, the warrior's strength. Starting in verse 7, he says, Only be strong and very courageous. It's the second time he said that. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. This is fascinating. God is promising success and prosperity. Doesn't that sound good? Let's try to understand it properly. As always, take things in context not just in the verses, but in this canonical context. What does the Bible say about these things? He says, Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that, uh, that Moses, my servant, commanded you. It's so interesting that God says, you're going to go and I'm going to give you the land. You know how you're going to do that? You're going to follow the law. You're going to obey my word. You're going to obey my commandments. That's how you're going to do it. 
How are you going to be equipped to take possession of the land? Obey me. Learn to follow my commandments. Now, what commandments is he talking about? Well, at that point, they had the Pentateuch, most of it. What a counterintuitive idea, right? You're going to go and you're going to, I'm going to send you on this military conquest. To do that, you need to be religious. Okay, that's not exactly what he says, but the idea is that it's not, he didn't say, um, be strong and courageous, prepare your, sharpen your swords, go through some battle tactics training with the army, make sure that the women are prepared to stay home. It's not what he says. He says, be courageous, be brave, follow my commandments. Know the law, meditate on it day and night. Let it be on your tongue. Speak it regularly. Think about it, dwell on this, chew on it. That is how you will find success. That is how you will make your way prosperous. How do you become successful in the thing that I'm calling you to do? Know my word. Live my word. Meditate on my word. So the question is, what does he mean by success? What does he mean by make your way prosperous? Well, we have to let the Bible answer that question for us. We, uh, we know from the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon sought all the things that we typically think of as success and prosperity. And, you know, there's, there's power and influence and wisdom and pleasure, uh, all kinds of stuff. Women, right? He chased after all these things. And every time, what's his response? It's all vanity. Means nothing. This is the wrong pursuit. I sought after this and I came up empty. This is the wisest man who has ever lived. The richest king in the history of Israel. He had everything he could ever ask for. And he said, it's all empty. So if those things don't define success, what does it mean? Well, we see in the context of Scripture that when God is talking about success, that you, your, um, your translation might have something that says, uh, instead of good success, you might, it might say you act wisely. Uh, something to do with wisdom, right? This idea that, um, uh, like in verse 7, it says that you may have good success wherever you go. It might say that you might act wisely wherever you go. What we see, what the Bible, when it says success and prosperity, what it means is God's plan will be accomplished, you will be successful in accomplishing the thing that God has called you to do. You will be successful in becoming the person that God has created you to be. So, if you follow my commandments, if you follow my law, you will have good success. You will make your way prosperous. Does that mean that we will always be comfortable or safe? No. Does that mean we'll never be sick? No. That is not what he means by prosperous. What he means is you will accomplish the thing that I intend for you to accomplish. Now, the enemy, this is where spiritual warfare comes into play. God calls us to do something. And we say, yes, Lord, I'm all in. And the enemy says, ah, that's going to hurt. That won't be fun. Are you sure you want to do that? God said this. Did he, you know, did he really mean like all the way? He's going to say, prosperity and success actually means this over here, this thing that you need to chase after, this status, this influence, right? He's going to, he's trying to twist the thoughts in your mind. Spiritual warfare primarily happens inside your mind. It's these thoughts that go through your mind that distort the way that you see reality. It distorts reality so that what you think you see is not actually what's there. The enemy wants to distort the truth. So when you say, um, what God wants for me, if I can accomplish what God wants for me, that is better for me than what I think is good for me. The enemy is going to say, no, it's not. Don't you see what these people have over here? Don't you see how good they have it? Solomon wrestled with this. David wrestled with this. Why do the wicked prosper? Some of the prophets wrestled with this. God, why don't you judge the wicked? 
Why am I over here suffering while they're prospering? Their priorities are switched up. God says, you will prosper. You will have good success when you obey me because I know what is needed. I know what's good for you. I'm the one that made you. I put you in where you are. I have created your circumstance so that you can look to me as you're going through it and know that I am with you. And that's all you need. And I will help you to successfully navigate the course of life that I've put you on. And as you do that, you will arrive at the very end that I originally intended for you. And your success may not be wealth, it may not be beauty, it may not be this or that, it may not be influence, but your success will be you have accomplished exactly what I meant for you to accomplish. You played the part that I intended for you to play. And when you come and see me face to face, you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That's our reward. That's what success means. Now the enemy is going to say, he's going to twist that, right? We talked about this. He's going to twist that. That's not actually better for you. God's just saying that because he doesn't want you to have this or that. Some of these thoughts go through our minds and we don't tell anybody (laughs) because we don't want them to know that we think these things. The enemy is working against you. He is trying to hold you back. The harder you pursue the Lord, the more he is working against you. I have found in my own life that I, um, I, I didn't encounter in crazy spiritual warfare until I came to Evergreen and came on staff. This is my first full-time staff position at a church. And it's different than the stuff that I've done before just by nature of being a church and not a business. I worked at companies before coming here. And um, I, it took me a long time to finally realize that it, this is spiritual warfare, what I was going through. Man, it was rough. It was hard. Um, last year even, and I won't go into all the details. We can talk one-on-one when we have more time. But last year was, was a really, really low year for me. Man, it was tough. Um, I was battling lies inside my head that I'd never um, battled before. I, I mean, I'd never encountered spiritual warfare like this. Now, some people say it's because I'm in ministry, I've got a target on my back. I don't think that's actually true. I think what it is, is I'm pursuing the Lord's will for my life. You will have the same target on your back as you pursue the Lord in your life. I'm not special because I'm in ministry. The enemy doesn't think more of me, and therefore he targets me more because I'm in ministry. The enemy is focusing on me because I'm pursuing the Lord. And you will have the same battles Maybe, maybe different specific battles for me, but you will have the same target on your back as you commit to obeying the Lord. Be ready for that. Again, it's not enough to just know how to fight those battles. You have to recognize I'm in the fight. I'm in the battle. These thoughts that are going through my head are not true. They do not represent reality, and I need to, re- I need to recognize that. I've called guys recently even to say, I'm locked inside my own head. I can't escape the thoughts that are in my head. I need you to give me perspective. Help me to see the truth because I can't see it right now. The enemy's voice is screaming in my head and I don't know how to escape it. Help me see the light. Give me perspective. Lean on those around you. Lean on those around you. The enemy is gonna say, you want success, I'll show you success. It's not true. Smoke and mirrors. It's all vanity. Knowing and abiding by the word of God is the recipe for success for Joshua and for us today. This carries over into the New Testament as well. We see this in John 15. Um, He says in in John 15, verses 4 through 10. Some of you may know this. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. 
Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We see this connection in this passage where Jesus is talking, the same connection we see in Joshua. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you, right? I will move in your life as you abide in my word, as my words abide in you, as you interact with me and develop intimacy with me, our relationship will accomplish things that you can't even imagine. Success is not what we achieve. Success is that we are useful to God because we are obedient to him. Useful not according to our own ideas, useful according to his plan. He says, this is what I want for you. This is the role that I have for you. And we say, yes. Now, as we, as we do that, this is the journey I've been on. I've, I've had moments where the Lord has spoken very clearly to me through his word in my quiet times or whatever, prayer times, and the Lord has dealt with some of the lies that I have believed in, uh, over time from the enemy. But what I still struggled with, there was one piece that was missing, at least one piece, at least the last piece he showed me. <laughs> um, and that is the warrior's resolve. It is not enough to hear from the Lord. That is not his goal. His goal is not merely for you to hear him. What he wants for us is to walk with him. So Joshua, God encounters Joshua and says, here's what I have for you. Here's the role that I want you to play. I will be with you. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do everything written in the law. And you will make your way prosperous and you have good success. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He emphasizes this point again. Be strong and courageous. Then he flips it. Don't be frightened or dismayed. That's just the opposite. He's saying, do this, don't do this. These are polar opposites. This is what I want you to be. Now, he doesn't say do strong things and be brave and, and go and, and be, you know, be a macho man. He says, be strong and courageous. It's passive. Be strong and courageous. That is sometimes way easier said than done. We can hear people all day long say, man up, you know, be a man, do this, be strong, stand firm, right? Michael says it all the time up here, stand firm in your faith, and he is absolutely right. And then the enemy comes in and whispers in our ear. He says, you're not good enough. <laughs> you're not strong enough. You don't have what it takes. God says, stand, be strong and courageous. Good luck. Have you seen yourself? Do you remember that time you fell down last week? Fell flat on your face. You think that's strong and courageous? The enemy wants us to be unstable. He wants us to be frightened, and he wants us to be dismayed. God says, be firm, be resolute, be strong and courageous. So how do we do that? We have to choose to walk according to what he has already told us. It's very simple, but this was what I was missing. I knew what God had spoken to me in my life about where I am, and where he's put me, and what I needed to do. The part that I was missing was I was still timid. I was shy about following through with the things he had spoken to me. He had dealt with some lies that were in my head. But when it came to actually moving forward, I was timid still. And God finally said, Andrew, wake up. You know what I've already told you. Now carry yourself in that manner. Have confidence in what I have spoken to you already. I, maybe you're like me, maybe you're not, but sometimes I have this idea that, uh, that we can move forward 
uh, in, in the plan that God has for us, but I, I, I kind of sometimes you know, hang my head down, don't look at me, you know, don't notice me, I'm just going to kind of go do my own thing. God says, I've spoken to you already. Stand up, hold your head up, stick your chest out, and go do what I've told you to do. You don't need to be shy about it. Don't be ashamed of what God has told you to do. Get up and go do it. There's a difference between humility, I'm sorry, there's a difference between arrogance and confidence. They're not the same thing. We think sometimes that confidence and humility are incompatible. That is a lie. Humility is understanding our position, recognizing it, owning it, taking responsibility for it. I recognize that I am a servant of the Lord. Sometimes I'm more of an assistant to the servant. (laughs) That's my position, and I know it. I'm not trying to be more than that but I can walk confidently as a steward of the things that God has given me. What is a steward, right? As a household manager in in the Roman Empire, a steward was someone who was given a charge over a specific task or set of responsibilities. They were a slave, but the homeowner, the, the master said, this is your responsibility. I'm giving you these things to manage. We are stewards of God. He says, I'm putting you here. These are the people I want you to interact with. These are the resources I'm gonna give you. This is the task that I have for you. Are we to then kind of walk around the house like, okay, you know, just don't look at me. I'm just going to go do what God said. We can stand up tall and say, God has put me here. This is the task he's given me. I'm going to go do it. I don't need your approval. Now, of course, we, all of this is in context of the scripture, right? We do everything in truth and in love. We speak with grace. We're trying to build people up. We're not defiant for the sake of being defiant. We're confident in what God has already spoken to us. Sometimes, there have been times in my life when I have been praying for direction. I've been praying for a word from the Lord. God, I need you to show me what to do. And God comes and says, I have already told you, go read my word. Get into the Bible and you will see the answer you're looking for. I'm over here trying to make it some mystical experience by praying to the Lord and saying, God, I'm here, show me. He says, I've already spoken to you. Stop asking me and go look for the answer. This is where, this verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He's repeating what he's already said. Remember, I am with you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. It's as if he's, he's forcing Joshua to say, Okay, I reject fear. The response he's looking for is for Joshua to say, I resolve to stand firm and push forward with the task that God has given me. This is my task. I don't need to be shy about it. I don't need to be ashamed. I don't need to be afraid. My job is to move forward with the thing that God has given me to do. That's my job. I'm going to do that with everything that I have. Until God gives me new instructions, that's my task. I'm going to stand up straight, and I'm going to march forward. Now, in this case, they were literally marching at times. <laughs> he is saying, will you resolve to follow me? God says, I'm telling you again, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I am with you. You don't need to worry about a thing. So let's stand up and let's move. Let's go together. I want us to look at one last thing as we wrap up here. I have, asked, I have asked the Lord at times, what is your plan for me specifically? What's my mission? And as I was preparing for this lesson, the verses that kept coming to my mind were the Great Commission. The Great Commission is a wonderful parallel to Joshua 1. We're going to go look at that in just a minute if you want to turn there in Matthew 28. But I, as, I would look, as I would think about the Great Commission, I remember several times praying to the Lord, okay, Lord, I know that, like, this is every believer's mission, but what's my mission? Like, what do you want from me? What's my role in the body? And what I was failing to see was the connection between the corporate mission and the individual mission. We have this idea in Western culture, this hyper-individualized culture, that I'm special and I need special instructions from the Lord. Now, 
He may give you instructions to say, this is what I have for you specifically. He, is, he does that. He's able to do that. It's his prerogative to do that. But what I have emphasized in my life, I've emphasized the individual. What do you have for me? Instead of saying, okay, Lord, what are you doing? And how am I going to be a part of it? There's a subtle difference there. One is, God, how do I fit into your plan? And one is, God, I'm special. Give me my, give me my marching orders. Okay, one is individualized and one is seen within the context of the body. It may be the same question, but it's a different tone. And I realized um, uh, that in, in the Great Commission, Jesus is speaking to his disciples before he goes up, uh, before he, his ascension. He's, he has been resurrected. He's with his disciples in Galilee. In the last words that the, that the Gospel of Matthew records for us from Jesus, he says in verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He says, here's your mission. Make disciples of all nations. Teach them to observe everything that I've commanded. Baptize them. And I will be with you always. This promise that God gave Joshua, I will never leave you or forsake you, Jesus extends that in the New Testament. He says, I will be with you always. That is a promise we can hold on to. That's for us. It's not just for Joshua and the Israelites. It's not just because they had the Ark of the Covenant or the temple or the tabernacle, whatever whatever time period you want to look at. Jesus says, I am with you always to the end of the age. But what's our mission? Go and make disciples. Okay, as I'm thinking about my role, where does that start? You start in the home. Start with your kids. Start with your grandkids. Make disciples. I remember a distinct shift in my thinking it was after moving to Evergreen. This was the first church I'd been a part of where, that took discipleship seriously. And I remember the shift in my thinking when I realized my job as a parent is not to be there to punish my kids. My job is to teach them how to grow and mature and follow the Lord. That's my job. I'm supposed to disciple them. <laughs> and it, it was such a foundational shift to realize I, I don't need to punish them because they're annoying me or because they're frustrating or they disobey. Discipline plays a role as a parent. We need to discipline our kids when they disobey. That's part of teaching them. But now, instead of saying, you disobeyed me, you're going to be punished, I can pause and I can say, okay, in my mind, I'm running through what's the lesson here? How do I handle this situation? Discipline may be a part of that. But now I'm thinking, how do I turn this into a teachable moment? What's the lesson they need to hear from me? So, for example, my son, uh, I, have, I have four kids, three girls and, and a boy. My son is our second. And he uh, was, we gave them instructions to clean. He and our five-year-old share a room right now. And so we gave them instructions to clean the room. Well, they're fighting, they're bickering. They, she's too short to hang up the clothes and reach it in the closet, and he doesn't want to help her. And, and there's just a lot of fighting going on. So I, we're, we're clean the room. You know, we've given you instructions. You need to obey. It doesn't matter. You need to be there to help her. Finally, I, I stopped, and I, I took my son, and I sat down, and I said, this is a lesson in leadership. So being the boss and being the leader are not the same thing. You are trying to be the boss of your sister and tell her what to do. Your job is to be a leader. You need to help her succeed, right? And we talked, we had that conversation. The point is, the disobedience led to a teachable moment. That's our goal, that's our task as parents. Disciple your children. If you're a grandparent and you have influence over your grandkids, disciple your grandkids. Maybe your role is not to discipline them. I, I don't know the dynamics of your house, of your family, but you can certainly still disciple them, right? If you, maybe, maybe you're in a situ situation where you don't have influence over your grandkids. We can pray with you over that. I know that some of you are in that, in that spot, and it's not of your own choosing. 
but think about where do you have influence? How are you grabbing somebody else to say, let me lead you in what we call following Jesus? Let me show you what that looks like. I'm still learning. I've got somebody holding me by the hand. I'm going to take you. Make disciples of all nations. That can be in your workplace. Sometimes that'll get you in trouble. I've been there, (laughs) and it was unexpected. Fortunately, it wasn't at the church. (laughs) That would be weird. Um, Our task as, as the body of Christ, we have a lot of commands in Scripture, but our overall mission is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that Jesus has commanded. In other words, the Bible. We can't do that if we're not in the Word. The enemy wants to pull us away from the truth. He wants to distort our reality and make us believe lies. We need to spend time reflecting, thinking, and saying, okay, this frustration I have in my marriage, this problem I'm having at work, this relationship that's a disaster, what's really going on there? How am I distorting the truth inside my own head? Call somebody and say, give me perspective. I need help. Help me to see this as it really is. Because when we can remember who the real enemy is, then we can properly fight that battle. We can put on the armor of God. We can pray. We can engage the enemy in the spiritual battlefield that is just as real as as any battlefield on this earth. And we can fight back. But how can you fight back if you don't even know that you're fighting? Spend time and reflect, where am I fighting the battle? And recognize that God has commissioned us for a task. And he says, if you abide in my word, I will abide in you and I will never leave you. I will enable you to push back against the darkness. And victory is guaranteed. We can choose to stand firm or we can remain ignorant and comfortable. But God has given us everything we need to stand on his word and fight. And if we are going to see success, and if our way is going to be made prosperous, we have to stand on the truth. We have to remember that God is with us, and he will see it through. Our job is to go, and he will give what we need. He will give everything that he has promised. If you don't know what that is, read this book. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you that there is truth. Thank you that we can know the truth. You have made it available to us. Father, I pray that as the enemy seeks to destroy us, as he seeks to tear down our marriages, as he seeks to rip our families apart, as he tries to tear tear up our communities through disunity and lies and propaganda, Father, I ask that you would uh, equip us to see the truth. Help us to become aware of the work of the enemy and not to, not to remain ignorant. We need you to speak to us, Father. We need to hear your voice. Remind us that you are with us. Thank you for your word that we can come to again and again and again to see the truth, to know the truth to push back against the lies of the enemy. Father, show us how we can link arms with those around us. Show us how we can walk with others and invest in them so that they can also understand how to fight the enemy, how to recognize the enemy. Father, build up your church. Strengthen us. Show us what it looks like to stand resolute on the truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.